Thanks, Serena. Um, now also coming, I guess, from Harvard of the West, Kirk Woods, who has been in Boston most of his career, if not all of his career, at Mass General, uh, last year moved to Stanford. His, his topic, which is truly appropriate for him, evolution of care for the thoracolumbar burst fracture. Um, when I started out, um, we had these classifications and burst fractures you fixed. And Kirk asked the long-term question, do you really need to do that? And it started getting people besides me, I'm not me, I kept operating, to think, are, there's those, are there fractures that may be burst fractures with bone in the canal that don't need to be fixed, that can be treated non-operatively, which led to a whole new series of classifications and discussions. So Kirk, welcome to California. Thank you uh, very, very much, Steve. Um, so I thought we would talk a little bit uh, today about what in both uh, Dr. Garfin's and my lifetime have witnessed uh, one of the really uh, significant uh, evolutions in our thought processes as respect uh, to thoracolumbar trauma, especially the burst fracture. As you all know, the spine can be broken basically one of four ways. And for three of the four, it's not really a big diagnostic dilemma. So compression fractures can often by times be treated non-operatively or sometimes now with uh, small little cement procedures. And fracture dislocations, as you know, where the spine is completely torn apart, often with neurologic devastation, are oftentimes treated in surgery. And the chance or the flexion distraction injuries where the ligaments are torn up also oftentimes end up uh, best treated with a surgical approach. But burst fractures, in the course of the last uh, 10 or th uh, 20 years, have undergone quite a transformation. And burst fractures, as you know, are probably the most uh, common things that come into our uh, emergency rooms or even oftentimes into the clinic offices and uh, require the most thought at this point in time because they can come in all different actual shapes and sizes. It was about 30 years ago that Francis Dennis uh, put forth two of his seminal articles evaluating his uh, experience with burst fractures in, at uh, the Twin Cities Spine Center. And Francis developed uh, his uh, three column spine theory for thoracolumbar injuries based on Dr. Louis' application of this in the cervical spine in France the decade before. And as I'm sure many will recall, the spine was thus divided into an anterior column where the, um, where the, uh, the, the vertebral bodies rest, the posterior column back here where the spinous processes are, and then he decided that there was a middle column which is right here in the back half of the front anterior column. So the three columns were anterior here, there was a middle in the back here which included the posterior disc, and then the posterior column back there. And the idea was that if two of three of these columns were disrupted, it was an unstable uh, injury. And in the burst fracture, it involves the whole aspect of both the anterior and the middle columns. And so because of his experience in Minnesota, he felt that those who were treated non-operatively had a greater risk of neurologic injury uh, if treated in that fashion and thus came to recommend uh, operative treatment. And because he took care of so many patients and had such an impact through the literature uh, in this regard, uh, 30 or so years ago, a, a burst fracture was basically treated with an operation much more commonly than ever thought before. But in the early part of the 1990s at the Utah, University of Utah Laboratories where Harold Dunn was uh, the professor and uh, Dr. James was one of his protégés, they took to try to ask that question, was the spine really unstable if those two columns were disrupted, the anterior and the middle column? And so they sequentially took apart a bunch of L1 burst fractures in vitro by sectioning the columns, first destroying the anterior then destroying the posterior column and then adding a middle column injury as well. And what they showed in their results was that it was the middle, excuse me, the posterior column 
It was the sectioning of those ligaments and the facet joints posteriorly that added much more instability than the simply fracturing the back half of that anterior column. So spurred on by this uh, uh, shift in thinking from a three column injury back to maybe there are two columns that are most important in evaluating the spine biomechanically. The medtronically uh, um, governed thoracolumbar spine classification system from the Spine Trauma Study Group produced a number of articles and a whole new classification designed to try to look at thoracolumbar burst fractures. Because what this group did for the very first time above and beyond almost any other classifications in orthopedics was look beyond the bones themselves at two other structures that happen to be in the spine very, very important. And those are the ligaments that are attaching one bone to the other and is the third, as you can imagine, the spinal cord and the nerves that are coursing through there. Things that are not typically taken into the classification of things like shoulders and knee fractures, so to speak. So what we did was we put together an injury mechanisms, mechanism system where you look first at the way the bone was broken in the whole traditional sense with compression fractures receiving very small point values because of the likelihood of being able to be treated non-operatively, all the way up to the flexion distraction injuries like chance injuries here, they were giving, given much more points on the system. Then we went to the second one and looked at the nerves themselves. Clearly, if somebody is neurologically intact, the need for surgery is less than if somebody has an incomplete spinal cord injury. And finally, we looked at that posterior soft tissue ligaments, the supra, the infraspinous ligaments, the ligamentum flavum, and the facet joints themselves. And if they were intact, again, as James pointed out the decade before, the spine is felt to be a lot more stable than if they're injured or suspect that they have been injured. And all of this is done through the, med the imaging, the plain x-rays, and very importantly, the exam itself. And what the TLEX classification system now does is gives you a number of points and you can decide whether this typical fracture maybe can be treated operatively or can be treated non-operatively. Because when you add a whole lot of points, you're much more likely to require surgery in terms of a successful outcome. And it can go the next step because it can tell you not only whether surgical might be uh, indicated or not, it can give you the approach whether a posterior spine fusion with reconstruction of those ligaments is involved, or here in the setting, let's say, of an incomplete spinal cord injury, anterior surgery with decompression is the preferred way. Now, what one has to remember when you look at all of this, however, is this is what would be considered level five data. Because there have been no prospective randomized studies about uh, comparing one of these to the other, this was all based on the expert opinion of 30 to 40 national and international experts who, who studied very little beyond uh, th spinal cord, uh, excuse me, uh, thoracolumbar spine injuries and came up with this whole classification system. So there does come with that caveat, but it has shown to be very helpful and very effective across the board when many people apply the point system. This system was at the same time uh, uh, similarly adopted by the AO Spine who came up with their own classification system, again, based on a two column A, a fractures where the anterior column is uh, simply involved in compression, a B injury here where there's distraction, and the C fractures are the fracture dislocations that we've seen before. This was done because uh, the Mogrel system has uh, many uh, different types and there's an absence of clinical decision making. But as I mentioned, the TLIX, on the other hand, had some certain creator bias involved in it as such, like this. But that, because what we have seen over time is that there are many injuries like this, burst fracture here at L5 with complete involvement of the spinal canal that can uh, be treated non-operatively very effectively, as you can see, with this brace and a leg extension. Or this forest ranger who fell from his stand a number of years ago, and you can see at the L4 nearly completely obliterated the spinal canal with bony fragments, 
yet he was absolutely intact from a neurologic standpoint. And so this is where something like some of the classifications fall out, and there may be outliers that may need further or more descriptive classification on their own. He was treated very effectively with a brace, just as we saw in the last injury, and was able to return to work. So with this as a backdrop, a number of years ago, we sought to try to ask the question, which of the most common uh, injuries, which is the thoracolumbar burst fracture between T10 and L2, that which we see so commonly in the emergency room after motor vehicle accidents or falls, with or without uh, neurologic injury, but especially that one that comes in where the spine is not disrupted in the ligaments and the nerves are typically fine, but it was that fracture that Francis Dennis instructed us on so many years ago needed to have an operation and did we really need to do that surgery? So when I was at uh, Twin City Spine at the University of Minnesota, we collected a perspective and started a randomized study of a number, number of individuals who were allocated to either receive a cast or a brace for the non-operability or who went to an operation for a thoracolumbar burst fracture. And just recently, we were able to return and visit with over 80% of them at over a 20-year follow-up to see how they were doing. And as it turns out, when we first looked at them four years after the injury, there wasn't a heck of a lot of difference between the two groups, again, suggesting that maybe we didn't really need an operation. But by 20 years, you can see that there's a distinct difference in between those who had an operation and those who were treated in a brace when we returned to visit them 20 years later. The same thing with the Roland and Morris back disability uh, indices where 24 is considered near normal and you can see there was a statistical difference there as there was with the Auswestry uh, back disability score. Now remember, zero to 20 is basically considered minimal disability. So both groups were really not doing too poorly at 20 years afterwards, but you can see that those who were treated without an operation were doing as a whole much better, but the range was exceedingly wide. You can see in the operative groups, some people with scores close to 50 out of 100. And finally, in the SF36, all the indices favored those who were treated non-operatively, especially social pain and general health. And those who were treated non-operatively more than twice as often were able to return to the work they were participating in before they had their injury. So we uh, felt and now can conclude to a reasonable degree that there really not only is there not a no advantage to the operative treatment like Dr. Dennis suggested with the neurologically intact mechanically stable burst fracture, but treating them in a cast or a brace may actually be significantly advantageous as has been echoed by numerous authors over the years leading up through this. Taking it the final step further, the group in Vancouver uh, just a little while ago completed the second of their third studies, taking it the next step. Well, if we don't need to do an operation and we put them in a brace, how about if we don't even need a brace at all? And they randomized a number of patients to either get a brace when they were in the hospital or they were simply cautioned for a couple days while they were in the, in the facility about taking it easy on their back and then let to go home with some uh, education about not avoiding certain activities but wearing no external immobilization at all. And when they came back in a year, there was absolutely no difference between the two groups. In fact, three of the four who ultimately required surgery came from the group that was actually wearing the brace. So when do we need surgery for thoracolumbar burst fractures? Because I've, as I've pointed out to you, a lot of the percentage we see have not only wide ranges in those who succeed, there is a certain percentage of those at the top, 10 to 20 to 30 percent in any study where they failed non-operative treatment. Well, certainly if there's multiple trauma involved in the situation, if you've got both arms broken and both legs open, it becomes very difficult to mobilize, or to mobilize rather, with or without a, uh, an orthosis if you've got a significant burst fracture and a quick and stabilizing fusion may be indicated. The obese individual, a corset or a brace will not uh, be effective on a spine the farther that the brace is from that spine 
from a, uh, uh, mathematically speaking. So surgically stabilizing a burst fracture may be a possible uh, suggestion for the obese individual. The senile people that we have seen who have the, so many of the compression fractures that have been treated with cement to this point in time can also actually burst that fracture as well with bone retropulsion into the canal. And the senile burst fracture or uh, the uh, uh, pathologically sort of osteo osteoporotic burst fracture is a different kettle of fish than that young 35 year old who fractures their spine in a bursting type situation because these people are at risk at further retropulsion of that bone into the canal with late neurologic sequela and need to be watched a lot more closely than your average individual. Certainly the ligamentous uh, complex, if it's been injured, is considered an unstable burst fracture and falls into the category of the flexion distraction injuries. And as we can imagine, surgery is oftentimes gonna be indicated when there are neurologic injuries. But of all the other people, what about the 10 to 20% who don't have any of these things who might have done better with an operation than treated with a cast or a brace? The MRI can show you subtle changes to the posterior osteoligamentous complex, as you can see here. Disruption of the supraspinous ligament here and the ligamentum flavum here, portending the possibility of late instability. Here's an example of that senile uh, compression bursting type injury, a CAT scan at the time of the injury with further uh, osteodegradation of the fracture itself with further retropulsion and late development of spinal cord, excuse me, spinal cord compression and bowel and bladder problems in this 87 year old who had a burst fracture at L1. And as I said, those, late, those older people who have those oftentimes present late, much after the, op, the fracture itself, over, oftentimes over a month later, and thus cannot and should not be simply discarded to return to the clinic in two to three months. So some of us may remember a, a, this publication in Spine 25 years ago that looked at what came to be known as a very important tool for those of us taking care of spine, the load sharing classification of spine fractures. And it's basically looking at those front on the images, including the CT scan, as to how fractured are those bones in terms of their comminution and their angulation. Because people have continued in certain situations to show and feel that their experience with the operative treatment of these birth fractures is superior to the non-operative approach. In fact, this group from the University of Virginia looked at 68 neurologically intact burst fractures just as we did in that same junction, all with a TLIC score of two suggesting non-operative care, but 25% of them failed mobilization and had to go on to surgery. And what they found was that they were more kyphotic at the fracture site, and significantly there was no more canal impression even though they were neurologically intact, there was no more retropulsion of the bone in those people who went on and ultimately came to surgery. And their score based on that system I just showed you was higher. There was more crumbling of their bone and there was more angulation involved. The group from China, a retrospective study similarly with TLIC scores under four, suggesting non-operative care, again, very well in 80% of them, but 20% of them didn't and had to be converted to surgery. Who had to be converted to surgery? The, those people who were more painful on admission, similar to the group in Virginia. So high VASs at the time of admission may be predictive of failure of non-operative care, although in their situation, kyphosis didn't turn out to be a problem. And from Iran recently, a prospective study looking at the non-operative treatment with bed rest and bracing for these similar fractures, less than score, found that 10% of them needed surgery for intractable pain, and it was the older individuals there who went on to require surgery more commonly than the younger. But again, they confirmed what the group uh, from China had shown, that the more retropulsion of bone, the more likely that your pain may be out of control and requiring, uh, uh, suggesting uh, operative care. Uh, 
Some people are, are obviating this nowadays with uh, the use of the cement procedures that we did for compression fractures, where under careful fluoroscopic guidance, you can introduce some fracture, some cement into the broken bone here and temporarily stabilize them with pedicle screws that come out later, sort of as an internal brace. But this is sort of a combination hybrid of all the factors that we've seen operatively as well as non-operatively. They tried to reduce, remove the pedicle screws after a year and found that the final VAS in this small group of patients using this technique was very, very successful. So where are we headed in the future? The pendulum has certainly swung from one end out to the other. Are we headed back again in the next direction from operative to non-operatively, heading back a little bit towards something in between? Uh, we'll see that in the years to come. Thank you. So that's clear, huh? <laughs> that's clear now. 